Welcome, everybody, to our weekly Come Follow Me video. We're going to do a little historical context and content from Alma 36, 37, and 38. There's just the three chapters this week, so it's a fairly short clip. But what we have here is Alma is speaking to his three sons. That's both this week and next week. And he has two of the sons this week. Now, this is interesting here because we have a father, Alma, being very intentional. In other words, he's not just the dad that sits back and says, my kids can do whatever they want. He's intentionally teaching them certain uh, things that he wants them to learn. Now, uh, again, remember that they just returned back from the mission to the apostate Zoramites. Well, two of the sons did. Helaman, who was the oldest son, did not go. He remained back. Uh, in the capital city, but Shiblon and Corianton did go with Alma on this special mission to uh, claim the, the 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 apostates and many Lamanites and and so forth. So this was a great uh, a great section here. Now in Alma thirty six, if we go there first, there's a couple of things I want to point out here that are interesting that uh, hopefully help us uh, understand a little bit more about this section here. In Alma thirty six, Alma calls his son Helaman young. Now, he's the oldest son, but it says he's young in verse 3. However, he can't be that young. Uh, young might be a relative age because in chapter 37, he's going to entrust him with the records and so forth. Plus, his younger brothers, we know Corianton, is old enough to be engaged in gross sin as he was when they were on their mission to the... Uh, with the Lamanites and, and the Zoramites. So we really don't know how old exactly, but uh, uh, he it says he's young, but he's old enough to be very responsible. So in Alma 36, there has been a lot written about Alma 36. There's some really, really, really neat things in there. But I do want to uh, just share one thing. I, I, again, we usually do just introductory uh, context in here to get you a, a nice start before you go in there, not go too deep. I do want to tell you about one thing that uh, might be interesting to you. Oh, it was about 50 years. There was a, a scholar who identified uh, a Hebrew writing style in the Book of Mormon, a chiasmus, if you're familiar with that. That is, it's like a poetic writing where whatever you say at the beginning, you kind of repeat at the end. So if I say A, B, C, then I go backwards. I go C, B, A. I love my wife, I love my mother, I love my kids. And then I would say I, how I love my kids, I love my mother, and I love my wife. So it goes in that order if I, if I said that right. Well, Alma 36 was noted to be one giant writing in this style and format. So I'd like to just share a few things with you. For example, in verse 1 it says, For I swear unto you, the, in so much as you shall keep the commandments of God, you shall prosper in the land. But again, the very last verse of this chapter says, For ye ought to know, as I know, inasmuch as ye keep my commandments, ye shall prosper in the land. And if ye had not ought to know also, that inasmuch as ye will not keep my commandments, ye shall be cut off from his presence. So there's this chiasmic writing where whatever said at the beginning is repeated in a backward setting. But there's also something really interesting in this chapter that's the opposite, meaning there is, uh, in the middle of that, there's some negatives where it will say one thing and then it will say the negative. Let me give you an example of this. Oh, in uh, verses 6 and 24, it says, destroy the church of God. And then in verse 30, 24, it says, bring souls unto repentance. One's about destroying the church. The other one's about building the church. And there's a lot of these in there. And they go, they follow that pattern just beautifully. Uh, again, verse 15, that I might not be brought to stand in the presence of my God. Verse 22 says, my soul did long to be there, referring to the presence of his God. Now, again, this, I, I don't mean to go too deep for you today. This is just a, a, a little background in there. But that is a fun way to go through and read Alma 36. The main part with Alma 36, though, is what's in the center that gets repeated multiple times right in the middle. It's all about the the Savior Jesus Christ. The center of this chapter is Jesus Christ and his atonement and what he did for us. Specifically, verses 17 and 18. There's some great things in there. I'll, I'll read a little bit here. 17, he was racked with 
torment while I was harrowed up in the memory of my many sins. Behold, I remembered also to have heard my father prophesy unto the coming concerning of one, the people concerning the coming of one Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to atone for the sins of the world. Now, as my mind caught hold upon this thought, I cried with all my heart, O Jesus, thou Son of God, have mercy on me. Do you see how it's it's going into it, and then it's just repeating it backwards? That's the center of the chapter. It's wonderful. Uh, another thing that's really interesting with this, though, is chapter 36 What in the original Book of Mormon was not its own chapter. If you read the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon, chapters 36 and 37 were together. The chaptering and verses, that's all been done afterwards, and they've made several changes since then. But but chapters 36 and 37 have a natural split. Even though both chapters are to Helaman, one is a loving father sharing his conversion story and helping his son see the Savior Jesus Christ. We get a very different feel when we go to chapter 37. So let's go there. Chapter 37. Five times in this chapter, Alma commands his son. Very strong language, at least in our modern English. I command you. And this is verses 1, 2, 20, uh, 27. Uh, they're all in here where it's, I command you. Well, what is he commanding him to do? Uh, verse verse 2, I also command you that ye keep a record of this people. That's not just, please, son, could you just take a few notes on the history of this people? It, here is a commandment. So something is going on in this language of this chapter 37 where Alma is using what we would call a covenant language. I, I command you, uh, take this upon you. Keep this. Preserve that's language found throughout. It's the same language uh, Nephi used when he commanded Jacob to keep a record. Again, it wasn't an option. It wasn't just some nice, hey, we need to pass this on. There is a covenant between two people and God that this record is being passed on. But this record here, Helaman wasn't Alma's first pick. It wasn't his first choice to keep the record. In Alma 50... I know this is later on, but Alma 50 tells us this. Verse 37 and 38, he tries to give the record to Nephi. Remember, Alma was the chief judge. Since Benjamin, it was passed from Benjamin to Mosiah, Mosiah to Alma, the elder, Alma, the elder to Alma, the younger. So for several generations now, it's been held by the chief judge. And the record of the kings, so forth, had the large plates. And then remember, uh, Nephi gave him to Jacob, and his sons had the small plates, and they've been put together. So for the very first time, we are leaving that king or chief judge as being the record keeper. And he, in verse 37, excuse me, 38, this is Alma 50, verse 38. Nevertheless, he had refused Alma to take possession of the records. Now, we don't know anything else. We don't know why. We assume he was a righteous man because everything else he did seemed to be righteous. But he's like, no, I'm not going to take care of the records. So Alma says, Helaman, I'm making a covenant with you and with God that you're going to take these records. And this is a very special moment in scriptures where a father is passing on the major responsibilities. And in the latter days, we've had prophets and apostles have this uh, responsibility. Joseph passed the record and the church really onto his brother. They were both killed at the same time. But later on, it's through Hiram's lineage that Joseph F. Smith, who also passes on responsibilities and calls his own son, Joseph Fielding Smith, and so forth. So it's been really interesting to see how some of these things work. In addition to the commandment to pass on this sacred record, there's several things in here that gets mentioned. One, the plates, tw uh, verse 24. The, now we're back in 32. Sorry if I lost you there. And Alma 32. In addition to passing on the record, and there's three records that we know of, the plates of Nephi, the plates of brass, and he also now has the 24 uh, plates that were gathered by the group that went up to try to find the city of Zarahemla. Uh, Limhi's people, 
they have those. And we also have the interpreters. The, these are Jaredite interpreters that somehow Mosiah got. Now, some scholars argue that maybe there were two set of, sets of interpreters. We really don't know. But somehow this is that set. And we do know that Joseph Smith had the Jaredite set because he said so. So here's the set of interpreters. So you have the records. You have the interpreters. Verse 38 is the only place in the scripture here where it mentions the ball by name. And we know now, whether whatever they called it back in Lehi's day, almost, well, not quite 600 years, but over 500 years previous to this, that they just called it the ball or the director. But here in chapter 36, verse, excuse me, chapter 37, verse 38, They call it Leahona, which is being interpreted a compass. Now, in the end of this chapter, Alma says in verse 46, look that if they would look, they might live. Verse 47, take care of these sacred things. Yea, see that ye look to God and live. Whether it's looking in the interpreters, looking on the plates, looking on this liahona or this ball, there is a symbol that Alma wants to clearly share with Helaman. That is, if you look, you'll live. And in this case, look to God and live on the liahona. So here is a beautiful record. Now, I've given you some background on these two chapters. As you read them, the more important thing to do is look for doctrines and principles that you can believe and understand and apply in your life and see the Savior in there. Uh, notice the Savior is in all of this. Look to him on these sacred records and these sacred artifacts. Look to him in your own life. Look at him in your conversion story. The Savior is all throughout these chapters. And then chapter 38, a very short chapter. Uh, it's that middle son Shiblon. Now, every parent uh, has uh, a kid that usually fits in one of these three categories. You have a Helaman who is going to be the chosen one. He will have the records. He'll have the inheritance. He will carry on the family name and make everyone proud. You will entrust him with everything. You might, hopefully not, but you might have a Corianton who uh, goes out and commits sin and major transgression and brings much heartache. He's what we discuss all next week. But you probably have some shiblons where you're kind of that middle child. You're not the prophet, yeah, but you're not the sinner. You just kind of fit in the middle in there. I think here is a good chance to talk with your children, maybe your grandchildren and say, you know, where are you? Who are you? Do you fit in one of these three categories? Uh, maybe Shiblon, it's a short one. He's like, I. You, you listen to your older brother's prayer. You don't get the heavy responsibilities. You're not going to have any of these records. He's the record keeper. But he tells him a few things. You're a good kid. And verse 11 and 12 is really his counsel. Watch your pride. Don't boast. In other words, you're a good kid, but don't let it go to your head. And verse 12 is probably the most quoted verse in this chapter. Use boldness, but not overbearance, and see that you bridle all your passions, that you may be filled with love. See that you refrain from idleness. In other words, be bold, bridle your passions, and don't be idle. And one of those, it's the bridle your passions, gives a blessing. If you bridle your passion, you're filled with love. Wonderful thing in there. Uh, so there's three great chapters. Good luck with studying them this week. I hope you find some beautiful gems that will bless your life. And I'll see you next week.